we will have a, our keynote from uh, the ACS current president, Bassem Chakashiri, and his demonstration of uh, some very entertaining science, and we look forward to seeing what he has to bring. Thank you, Bassem. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of ACS, I also would like to extend welcome to all of you who are participants and contributors to a very important aspect of our chemical sciences. Uh, I also want to congratulate the Green Chemistry Award winners for their accomplishments. And as I told um, um, them last evening and yesterday afternoon, uh, these awards salute them for their accomplishments, of course, but they're also a charge to them to maintain their excellence in green chemistry. I want to also congratulate uh, Bob Peoples and the staff of the Green Chemistry Institute for their persistence and for their insight to helping us all address very important societal issues as they relate to our chemical profession. Uh, <clears throat> so the title of my talk today is For the Benefit of Earth and Its People. That's what green chemistry is all about, for the benefit of Earth and its people. Today we face grand challenges as scientists and as a society. These challenges are partially enumerated here. Uh, the big challenge is to help sustain Earth and its people in the face of population growth, finite resources, malnutrition, I might add now also obesity, spreading disease, deadly violence, war, climate change, and the denial of basic human rights. In particular, the right to benefit from scientific and technological progress. <clears throat> it is incumbent upon us as responsible scientists and citizens to see to it that our science serves society and reaches everyone around the globe because scientific advances have no geographic boundaries. I'd like to leave this slide up for another moment so we each reflect on what is beneath those words, population growth, and what we might do about that. Finite resources, water, for example. What are the challenges that we have not only around the world, but in the United States for quality of water. This bottle represents great technological achievements. The plastic that it's made from, the shape that it's in. You see the shoulder here, and then the neck, and the cap, all due to human ingenuity and discoveries that we have made, and what's in it should be available to all of us around the globe, not necessarily in this container or in such containers. Spreading disease, green chemistry can contribute, it does contribute enormously to pharmaceuticals and the dispensation of pharmaceuticals all over the world. Deadly violence, war, climate change. If between now and the time I die, which I hope is not too soon, I do not succeed in having an intelligent conversation with my neighbor about evolution, that would be a very sad situation. If between now and the time I die, I do not succeed in having an intelligent conversation with my neighbor about climate change, the consequences can be catastrophic. We all should think about that 
and should act in responsible ways. Science and society have what is essentially a social contract that enables great intellectual achievements but comes with mutual expectations of benefiting the human condition and protecting our planet. Solutions to the world's problems demand thinking outside the box and encouraging radical innovation, both coupled with transformative changes in education. We must aim to affect comprehensive fundamental and systemic change in our own attitudes and in our behavior as scientists and as responsible citizens. Purposeful communication of the critical role of science and technology in society can help alter attitudes of the general public and can also foster collaboration among people across geographic boundaries to work together to solve global grand challenges. We must contribute to the creation of a fair and just economic system Acknowledging that the world does not have finite, uh, does not have infinite resources, but has finite resources. And in everything we do, we must be humane and humanitarian in keeping with our stewardship of Earth and its people. That is part of the social contract that we have with society. And of course, we ask society to support our activities, our research, our education, our innovation. And I'd like to <clears throat> remind everyone what the ACS mission is. One of my goals is that if someone were to call you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and ask you what the ACS mission is, you wouldn't have to go look it up to answer the question. I know you can read it but I'd like to read it out loud. Advance the broader chemistry enterprise and its practitioners for the benefit of Earth and its people. For the benefit of Earth and its people. And of course, the ACS vision, improving people's lives through the transforming power of chemistry, transformations, is what we're all engaged in. So we expect, as part of our social contract with society, to be supported for what we do. And I'll talk about that in just a second. The theme that I've selected for this year is advancing chemistry and communicating chemistry with the initiatives that are listed there. This is the sesquicentennial of the Land Grant Act. Chemists. Chemical scientists, engineers have made great contributions in the past 150 years. And we should acknowledge them and tell each other about them. And for that purpose, I invite you to come to visit my website, which I will give you the uh, link to shortly, where, where I have listed about 15 major contributions from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, my home institution. Vitamin D, warfarin, climate tracking satellites, the Social Security Act. I won't list them all. Just ask you to go look at them. I'll come back to the ACS Commission on uh, the purposes of graduate education in the chemical sciences and on the working group that is aiming to help the public understand the science of climate change. We advance chemistry through research, through education, and through innovation. Scientific research, the solitude of the investigator, the teamwork that we all enjoy and learn from and contribute to, the educational offerings that we have in formal settings, and also in informal settings are essential to advancing chemistry. And of course, innovation is at the heart of the creativity that we are 
beneficiaries of, and that we contribute to help benefit <coughs> advancing society. On the communication front, <coughs> there are several elements. I just list some of them here briefly. First is to inform CNN, Fox News are about information, perhaps misinformation. The purpose of communication, one purpose is to inform, another one is to engage, a third one is to educate, <clears throat> excuse me. A fourth one is to advocate, and of course, to persuade, <clears throat> excuse me. So when, it, so when it comes to green chemistry, do any of these activities fit into your own personal schemes to inform, to engage others, to educate ourselves and others, to be advocates, and to be persuasive? I ask you to think about that. And most Albert Einstein said, most of the fundamental ideas of science are essentially simple. Maybe to him they were simple. <laughs> and may, as a rule, be expressed in a language comprehensible to everyone. It is essential that we not only succeed in communicating chemistry to each other, but to communicate chemistry to the general public. And we remind ourselves of this statement that most of the fundamental ideas of, chem of science are essentially simple and may, as a rule, be expressed in language comprehensible to everyone. Bob Peoples and his staff developed a little card like this that contains the, it's the pocket guide for what green chemistry is all about. And there are two versions of it. There's the version for the, us that to use among ourselves, and there's another version that can be used in an elevator talk. That relates to what I'm using Einstein's quotation for here. Science is vital to democracy. If you believe, as I do, in the democratic institutions that we belong to and the foundations of our great nation, you too will join in doing your part as scientists and as citizens to maintain and advance all the democratic institutions that we cherish. Abraham Lincoln said, public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. And without it, nothing can succeed. It is part of our responsibility as scientists and as citizens to address the public and to share our convictions on, and our values with them as we try to advance science and to advance and to communicate science. So connectivity is very important. And what do I mean by connectivity? <clears throat> We live now in the most advanced scientific and technological society in the history of humankind. Science is one of the most important forces affecting human society. The difference between the way we live now at the dawn of the 21st century and the way our ancestor lived, say, 200 years ago, are due mostly to science and its resultant technologies. It's impossible to understand contemporary society without some appreciation for science, how it works, and what it tells us about the physical world. Science is fundamentally a human endeavor, driven by the same impulses that motivate much of human activity. Curiosity about the unknown, the thrill of discovery, delight in creativity, and the benefits derived from such understanding. 
Fundamental too is the desire to share the curiosity, thrill, delight, and benefits. This desire to share is perhaps most acutely displayed by science faculty and teachers and communicators, whose deepest desire is to effectively communicate the beauty of science both in and out of the classroom. And one of the most effective means of communicating this beauty, of stimulating curiosity, and of sharing the thrill of discovery in science is through demonstrations of physical phenomena. And that's what we're going to do now. And of course, we always obey the safety rules. So you all see what I'm doing. And I'd like to ask you to focus your attention on this part of the table, where between my two hands, what do you see between my two hands? What shape are they? How many of them are there? Do I have to ask all the questions? <laughs> I am told that the brain receives about 11 million bits of information every second. We have to help the brain focus. By the way, how do we know that the brain receives 11 million bits of information every second? So we have four cylinders. They're glass cylinders. They could be plastic, though, right? Um, what size are they? Are they small cylinders, big cylinders, medium-sized cylinders? Are they 10 liters in size? Are they 10 milliliters in size? Are they somewhere in between? They're one liter in size. And they have in them, what do you suppose we have in them? What do you see? How do you know they're liquids? They could be gels, right? How do we find out? We shake them a little bit because we know from experience what liquids do when they're shaken. Connectivity. We have to connect what we know with what we're seeing. And what do these cylinders have in them? Liquids. And what else can you tell me about them? Colored liquids, right? And what colors are they? So uh, the liquid on the left-hand side has a blue liquid has blue color in it, the liquid on whose left? <laughs> okay. You know, I, I, I'd just like to take a moment to tell you what I do in my very large uh, chemistry, introductory chemistry course at the university. In order to, to help the students make observations and make sense of the observations, I say to them, pretend to be the play-by-play -play radio announcer describing to someone who's not with us what's actually going on. Not the TV announcer. That person has got it made because the picture tells almost everything. Right? So we have these cylinders. They have colored liquids in them. And we're going to do some experiments now using a substance called dry ice. And as we all know, dry ice is a solid and changes from being a solid to a gas without melting by a process we call sublimation. And dry ice is at minus 78 degrees Celsius, so I put the gloves on to hold a chunk of dry ice because otherwise I would suffer from a frostbite. <clears throat> and dry ice changes from being a solid to a gas, as I said already, by this process we call sublimation. So I'm going to take chunks of dry ice. I'm going to put them in the cylinders. And what do you see? You're doing the play-by-play -play description. Does this help? Does this help? Yes? If you want to make good connections, if you want to <clears throat> avoid impedance problems, you have to be set up and ready to display whatever it is you're trying to display. So what do we have in here? We have, what do you see? Bubbles, right? What kind of bubbles are those? Carbon dioxide bubbles. Where are they coming from? From the sublimation of dry ice. Right? They're coming from the sublimation of dry ice. And what else, what else do we see? We see some foam coming off here. That's because each of these cylinders <clears throat> has in it an acid-base indicator and a little bit of household ammonia. And the ammonia is sudsy, as you can see here. So you can also <clears throat> see that maybe, well, what do you see? Are the colors staying the same or are they changing? You're shaking your head. What? Are they changing? 
from what? They're getting lighter in all, the, in all four cylinders? Only in the two cylinders that I put the dry ice in, right? Right? So sharpen the powers of observation and the ability to report them. So I'm going to take a chunk of dry ice now and put it in this cylinder here. So these acid-base indicators, well, that's enough in there. This one is bromothymol blue. This next one is, this one here is what? Mumble, mumble, mumble. What is Phenothaline, yes. And this is a mixture of acid-base indicators. This is universal indicator. Now, if you use sodium hydroxide instead of household ammonia, you get a much sharper color change. Why is that? Because sodium hydroxide is a strong base and ammonia is a weak base. And you get a buffering act action here. But you still get color changes. Um, and we have to be patient in making all of these observations so that we make the proper connections and the proper connectivity that we have been talking about. Um, why do you suppose I have left the, this, this one here without dry ice in it? For comparison purposes. For comparison purposes. All right, so this is an experiment <coughs> involving... Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. You know, of course, don't you, that every tri, any triatomic molecule in the gaseous phase is a greenhouse gas. Did you know that? Young ladies and gentlemen, did you know that? Well, you're just learning it, right? Every triatomic gas, every triatomic molecule in the gaseous phase is a greenhouse gas. Why is that? So we need to educate ourselves about greenhouse gases, about global warming, the role of chemistry in <clears throat> the different processes that contribute to it. I'll come back to that in a second. Now what I'd like to show you is um, another experiment, but this is from the ACS this website. It's a 2,000 milliliter beaker, it's a two liter beaker. I have a magnetic bar coated with Teflon sitting on the platform of a magnetic motor. I'm going to take three clear and colorless liquids and mix them together. Here's the first one, uh, as it was before, but here's a clear and colorless liquid. And let's now add the third liquid and see what happens. And we see uh, two color changes. Uh, that uh, went from yellow to blue. Let's increase the rate of mixing a little bit here. You can see some um, bubbles in there. Those are uh, oxygen bubbles, uh, also some carbon dioxide bubbles. The overall reaction here is the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, um, but there are other chemicals in there. Uh, of course, there's water in there. There's manganese sulfate, potassium iodate, sulfuric acid is in there, potato starch is in there. The yellow color that just disappeared is the color of iodine, and the blue color is the color of iodine with potato starch. And these oscillations will continue until we run out of one of the uh, reagents. This is an example of what is called a chemical oscillating reaction. Uh, it is one of about 50 known such reactions, but this one is very special to me. It's special for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that it was discovered by two high school teachers and it's named after them. It's called the Briggs-Rauscher reaction. Briggs and Rauscher taught high school chemistry and physics in Northern California and in 1973 they published a paper in the Journal of Chemical Education describing this beautiful and captivating behavior. The second reason it's special to me is that it took researchers, high-powered researchers, members of the National Academy of Sciences. It took them nine years to figure out what's going on in this very beautiful system. So when we do experiments, when we engage in scientific research, we have to be patient. We have to be paying close attention to the, to the transformations that are taking place. We have to enjoy what's going on. And we have to learn how to deal with frustration uh, until we get enough information about the chemical transformations that we are enjoying. Now that we know what's going on in this system, uh, we can control the conditions and, con and, and, uh, and produce this very nice and attractive uh, transformation of, uh, of color.
So you can appreciate why we can't do that experiment live here, because how many of the uh, chemicals that were identified are green? <laughs> Sulfuric acid, potassium iodate, malonic acid, potato starch is all right, right? Iodine, producing iodine, hydrogen peroxide, this was 30% hydrogen peroxide. Um, so it's fascinating to use such an experiment, more so live than it is on video. But on video, you can play it back as many times as you want to, and you can say, you can even cut off the audio and narrate it yourself as, 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 you, as you wish. And that's why I invite you to go to the ACS website. This is posted on the ACS website. It's called Bite Size uh, Science. Um, it's one of several um, <clears throat> such clips that are posted there. So, so we, we said uh, back to this experiment for, for a moment. This is um, the uh, carbon dioxide uh, forming carbonic acid, of course, carrying out this uh, different uh, set of uh, transformations we saw over there. I'll put this here so um, we don't need it anymore. But I'd like to ask you now to look at this um, plastic dish pan. Plastic dish pan. Um, it's empty except for air, right? We can't see air. It's invisible. So I'm going to take some um, water, boiling water, and put it in. What do you see coming off the top? Steam is invisible. You can't see steam. What you see is condensed water vapor. And it's condensing because the hot water molecules hit the cold air, they cool off, they condense, and then they dissipate. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is take chunks of dry ice and put them in there. Peter, are you taking good pictures? It's for you, Peter. And what do you see now? Steam? No. You see condensed water vapor. The condensation is taking place on the carbon dioxide coming from the sublimation process. And you see that the fog is moving downward, telling us, if we didn't know it, that carbon dioxide gas is denser than air. And if we did know it, this is a nice, beautiful way to remind ourselves of it. Um, this is how they make fog in the movies sometimes. Take boiling water, add dry ice to it, put a fan on it, and blow it. Not in any direction they want because of the properties of the carbon dioxide um, that's involved. So carbon dioxide gas is a greenhouse gas, and we want to learn more about it and re realize that we have contributed to the understanding of the properties of all these chemicals so that we, now more, we know now more about scientific advances and the consequences of these advances. <clears throat> the Industrial Revolution has been very successful. The quality of life that we enjoy now is, to a large extent, the result of all the advances since the Industrial Revolution. But along with those advances came advances in our knowledge of what else is going on with those different systems. And that's why we need to be learning more about the effect of chemicals and the responsibility that we have in producing them, in using them, and in safely disposing of them. And to that extent, I'd like to point out something that I feel very strongly about, and that is we must be proficient and technically skilled in what we do, because in addressing the global grand challenges, those challenges require great technical skill. But proficiency or technical skill alone do not ensure responsibility and stewardship. The recent actions of some intelligent and highly skilled professionals in our financial institutions suggest serious character flaws and shocking disregard for society. In a free and civil society, such as the one we belong to, People must be virtuous as well as skilled. 
the grim financial market condition is not only an economic failure, it is a failure of our culture. We have failed in educating ourselves, not only in learning the difference between right and wrong, but in behaving accordingly. We must assure that the next generation of chemical scientists is both highly skilled technically and properly educated to carry on their scientific and educational work for the common good of society. You might ask, why do we try to communicate via demonstrations? All you have to do is look at the faces of the people in this audience attending a Sciences Fund presentation in the Hildale Shopping Mall in Madison, Wisconsin. Just look at the faces of the youngsters, look at the faces of the adults, and that gives you an indication of the, about, about the importance of connect, connecting and about the importance of connectivity. So here's how you get to my website, scifund.org. Some of you are trying to write it down. You don't have to write it down. Just say it quietly a couple of times, scifund.org, S-C-I-F-U-N.org. Say it a few times and you memorize it. But what good is it to memorize it if you don't use it? So scifund.org is, in addition to the ACS website, is where I invite you to go. I'd like to mention one specific example that relates to communicating chemistry that we use at the University of Wisconsin in my program, which is the Wisconsin Initiative for Science Literacy. That's what WISL stands for. The Wisconsin Initiative for Science Literacy has a program, graduate student awards to promote communicating chemistry. I invite all PhD chemistry candidates to include a chapter in their PhD thesis communicating their research to non-specialists. And we give every person $500 cash award. We said we'll do it for the first 10. We've gone way beyond the first 10 whose PhD thesis includes such a chapter. What's the goal? The goal is to ex explain the candidate's scholarly research and its significance to a wider audience that includes the candidate's mother, grandfather, friends, civic groups, newspaper reporters, state legislators, and members of the U.S. Congress. And the Wisconsin Initiative for Science Literacy assists in the public dissemination of these contributions. And of course, we seek to increase the number of these awards. You can read all these chapters. They're posted. Where are they posted? On the website. How do you get to the website? Siphon.org, right? S-C-I-F-U-N.org. So take a look there, and you'll see uh, what has happened now in the past 18 months since we started this program. Actually, it's 20 months right now. All right. Um, for those of us who care about the quality of science and the quality of life, we should be informed about reliable uh, sources of um, information. And so I ask, I dare ask for a show of hands in the audience, how many people know or have used science and engineering indicators 2012? Just raise your hands. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you care like I think you do about the quality of science and the quality of life in America, please Google or use whatever search engine you want, science and engineering indicators. It's a very useful source of information. It has lots of data and lots of other resources that help us communicate not only with each other, but with others in society. Now I'd like to <clears throat> address what I call the scientist citizen. We are scientists. We love what we do. And we like to share what we do. But beyond that, as I have already alluded, we have a responsibility, not only to ourselves, but to others in our society. 
And I mention three exemplars. Rachel Carson, 50 years ago, published Silent Spring. It has greatly affected the practice of our profession. Linus Spalding, a Nobel laureate, the only person to receive two Nobel Prizes in two different areas. Sherry Rowland and his contributions to the understanding of stratospheric chemistry, also a Nobel, Nobel laureate. You and I do not have to be Nobel laureates to be scientist citizens. Each one of us at the local level has the awesome responsibility of sharing our values with others, not only in the classroom, but especially outside the classroom. The Green Chemistry Awards are part of what's called the Green Chemistry Challenge. It is my hope that the word challenge will disappear as quickly as possible to become, to be replaced by accomplishments. The green chemistry should not be something that happens only when we talk about it. It should happen everywhere we do, every, everywhere. And that's why I urge you to consider becoming and behaving as a scientist citizen. Now, I'd like to, let me, let me skip this. I want to get to the, uh, we have the wrong set of slides. These are the ones that, okay, how do I go back here? Previous, right? Okay. Frank, where is Frank? <laughs> we got the slides mixed up, but that's okay. That's all right. Okay, here are the links that I'd like to point out to you. So to visit the climate science, do you have it? Huh? That's the one we're using. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite you to visit the ACS uh, Climate Science um, um, web there, and that is at acs.org slash climate science. And I already showed you the siphon. Um, but I'd like to have a, a, a show of hands here just to get us to feel a little bit more comfortable in terms of what we talk about for the need of a climate science education. So, which of the following four gases, and they're all at least triatomic or more, okay, is the most abundant, which of the following greenhouse gases is the most abundant in the Earth's atmosphere? I'll list them, and then we'll have a show of hands. Methane, ozone, carbon dioxide, water vapor. Methane, ozone, carbon dioxide, water vapor. How many think it's methane? Raise your hand if you think it's methane. How many think it's ozone? Is anybody out there? Hello. Oh, I hear laughter, yes. How many think it's carbon dioxide? Raise your hand if you think it's carbon dioxide. And how many think it's water vapor? Water vapor. You are an unusual audience. <laughs> you are an audience ready to use the toolkit that the ACS Climate Science Working Group is developing for the purposes of communicating the climate science that needs to be communicated not only to ourselves, but, but to others. 
And I invite you to now write down that link right there, acs.org slash climate science, because there you will see the four modules in the climate science toolkit. It is still in development. It will be ready by the ACS Philadelphia time. And we invite you to comment about it directly. That's a way in, by which we can receive information um, from you. Okay, so um, now I come to the part where I'd like to have, as time allows, a conversation with, with you about issues and concerns that you might have uh, regarding um, Green Chemistry Institute, um, the American Chemical Society, the role of science in society, or about anything else that I have said this morning, or anything else that's on your mind. So I'd ask you to just uh, raise your hand and speak out loud, and uh, we'll, we'll have a question and answer period now. Yes, yeah, speak out so I can hear you. Oh, there's a microphone, that's even better. Al Matlack, University of Delaware. Uh, one of the things that you put on an early slide was population growth. The cheapest and most efficient way of approaching this problem, also the problems of malnutrition and war, is to fund family planning, <clears throat> which unfortunately our Congress doesn't seem to want to do. <clears throat> So the payback, dollar for dollar, is very high for this, much more than doing some other things. Okay. For example, the science had an issue on how to feed 9 billion people, and 11 comments came in, try family planning first. This is a conversation. I, I'd like to, yeah, yes. University of Scranton, and uh, as you know, Dr. Shakashiri, um, our formal education in chemistry in most of the fields is through textbooks. And if you peruse textbooks, you see very little about green chemistry and virtually nothing about sustainability issues. How is ACS addressing this situation and promoting the uh, issues of green chemistry and sustainability? into textbooks, particularly mainstream textbooks from gin, chem, to organic, to non-science majors, et cetera. Mike, Mike, how do you think ACS should address it? Let me, let me, let's have a conversation about it, okay? So it's, it's I, I know what's behind your question, but so you have an opportunity to say what you really, <laughs> what you really mean. Well, I, I would love to see ACS promote this in, in every way it can. For instance, they standardize exams. How do we get green chemistry questions, sustainability questions into standardized exams? How do we get um, uh, the Committee on uh, Environment, uh, excuse me, uh, professional training to ta really take it seriously and require perhaps even departments or textbook or departments to start educating uh, future chemists and even non-chemists about all these extremely important issues. Uh, the, uh, I, I know Mary Kirchhoff at uh, ACS is a really strong component, uh, proponent of green chemistry education. But it, it, some of us have been in doing this for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, and we made some advances, but not much. You know, I could take the chemistry textbook that I used for organic chemistry back in 1966 and basically use that to teach organic chemistry today. The fundamentals are there. Organic chemistry textbooks have changed little except for nice little vignettes at the beginning of the chapter and middle of the chapter in boxes that we all conveniently ignore because it's simply not part of the mainstream of the textbook. How do we get it into the mainstream of the textbook? And I don't know the answers to all of these things for sure. I wish I did. But I think we need to convince authors of mainstream chemistry textbooks they say this is a value-added proposition along with the publishers. One of the great things about the ACS is that it gives us a very uh, significant platform to address those kinds of questions. But addressing them is not enough. We have to act on, on, on that. And so 
ACS being primarily a volunteer organization with an outstanding staff, uh, can benefit greatly from persistence in raising such questions and causing the various committees that we have, Committee on Professional Training, for example, as you mentioned, and others, to uh, pay the proper attention and exert the influence that we have, that we can have, that we should have uh, on, on, such, uh, on such questions. Thank you, Mike. Anyone else? Yes. You've uh, correctly identified the ACS Green Chemistry Institute as an outstanding catalyst for spreading green chemistry uh, principles and activities throughout the chemical enterprise. And they've been very successful in the industrial sector, which is an area that I understand ACS would like to do a lot more with and have more contact. But they're really, really strapped for resources. Um, what can the ACS do to get them more resources so they, they can do more? Because they can have a much bigger impact than they're having now. Well, the question about impact is, is, of course, important. And not only what can the ACS do, but, you know, what the, the real question is, what is the appropriate role of ACS in all of these questions? So there are lots of issues that we can deal with and lots of issues that we, we feel uh, obligated to address, as I have tried to suggest. <laughs> Did I leave anything out from the list that I have shared with you? So the, the, the real question that faces us is what is the appropriate role of the ACS at different times? It might be one today, it might be different tomorrow. So, so that, that to me is, is, is the question. And, and, uh, and again, I'd like to repeat what I said before. ACS is a platform for conversations, for, for, for exerting influence, uh, a ACS remains the preeminent scientific organization in, in the world because we're open to such conversations and such, such discussions. Um, we have a, a, a number of uh, uh, new initiatives, the uh, Entrepreneurship Initiative, for example, uh, just to mention the most recent one. Um, but, but there are others that we should also be looking at and deciding what is the appropriate role for ACS to pursue at that time? Anyone else? Yes. I think that if we look at, if we look at green chemistry, it involves a paradigm shift. And one of the, the aspects of a green chemistry initially that made it non-acceptable was that it was outside the normal realm of, of what I call the horizontal pathway from raw materials to final product to disposal. From my experience, and I'd like to hear your, your perception and the ACS's stance on this, the more we can make a horizontal pathway that aligns itself with green chemical paradigms and thinking, the more that it will become acceptable mainstream and the more funding will come from it and the more that it will be involved in text because it will be part of the main culture. Uh, what is your take on that? Yeah. Well, I think I, I agree. The, 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 more we, the more we think about it, I think it, it is very good because I am not sure, correct me if I'm wrong, that we all have the same sense of what is meant by green chemistry. We have different elements that we call green chemistry, and that's fine. And I'm not saying we should develop uh, one set with one size fits all for all kinds of measurements. But I am saying that we should have a better understanding. So green chemistry becomes an attitude and not just a slogan. I'm not saying it's just a slogan right now. I'm saying we have to make it part of our own attitude. It's like safety. To me, safety practices should be like personal hygiene. And I'm saying green chemistry should also be like 
like that too. That requires a, a tremendous change in, in culture, in attitudes. And, and, and you know I can't change your attitude overnight any more than you can change my attitude overnight. Um, so, so that's why the, the, the great intellectual contributions that we make and try to, to, to put into the social contract that I was talking about is at the very heart of what I believe ACS can promote and is promoting. Nina. The summit was great. I, I just want to say publicly, uh, all of us owe you a thanks. You've been a, a great ACS president, and what you're doing for us here and for the profession is great. I have one suggestion with respect to the presentation. I wish you'd add a note on collaboration. That's different from communication. And particularly with green chemistry, it is important to collaborate. Yes. Right now, I'm on a personal kick of working with business schools to get green business into the, into the curriculum and to get basic green science and engineering into the business curriculum. The way we can really communicate this is by commercializing it. The people who are using it are the people who are going to promote it and, and do our marketing for us. So just a suggestion, but if you would add collaboration, I think it would be uh, a, a good thing to do. Thank you, Nina. Thank you very much. That's very well taken, yes. Hello, my name is uh, Mark Murphy. I was the uh, person who conceived the Herxelanese uh, green process for ibuprofen. And what I would like to say is, <clears throat> At the time, I was being schooled in quality. Use quality as a rubric for improving everything you do and all the aspects of life. We saw green chemistry as part of that, but only as a part of that. And I'd like to suggest that teaching people to focus on quality is a broad rubric that inclu includes everything, including green chemistry, including economics, including law, and all that sort of thing. And that that's something I'd suggest that you teach your students and your employees. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank you for your attention this morning and for um, being here. But more importantly, I want to thank you for what you're going to be doing after this conference, because that's what really counts. And, and, and not only the young people, but all of us have awesome responsibilities. And I look forward to seeing you at future ACS regional and national meetings and other conferences. Thank you all very much. Dr. Shakashir, with the token of our appreciation for being